Rich. Hey. Welcome. We are Sean and Jill O'Connor, and right. we are so glad that you're joining us, whether you're online or in person. Welcome. If you're new here, thanks for walking through those doors. We see right that here. courage and we welcome you. We even have a free gift for you. So if you head Ooh. out the doors to the Welcome Center, you can grab it there. And also just an FYI, um, our Welcome Center houses pretty much all the answers to all the questions you mm -hmm. would have about this Everything. place. So go ask them the questions. They'd be happy to get you acquainted Any and have you join our starting point class that happens every Sunday at 11 a.m. Now, if everyone could pull out your cell phone, we want to see who still has a flip phone. <laughs> just, just kidding. Uh, we actually would love for you to download the Salem Alliance app uh, and check in. So if you don't have the app yet, you can easily download it mm -hmm. in the App Store. This helps us stay in touch uh, and also gives you great resources like the di Digital Bulletin, uh, which will help you uh, know just what's going on. Young Adults has an incredible fundraiser coming up called Dump Day. Dump Day. And this is on Saturday, October 29th and Sunday, October 30th, where they will come pick up all your stuff, if Jump. you know what I mean. Like all the stuff that you want taken to the dump, mm -hmm. they'll show up, pick it up, mm -hmm. take it to the dump. In return, you have the opportunity to make a tax deductible donation come on. for them to raise money to go to their fall retreat. So let's put this on your radar and start cleaning out your space and sign up online at yasamalliance.com. Men's day away. Men, you're invited to our first men's day away. This is a time for us to practice solitude mm -hmm. and to lean on Jesus. So join us for this day away, October 22nd. We're looking forward to it and you can register online today. Do you love decorating your house for the holidays sure do. and get a kick out of matching that said decor? with your own outfit. Every day. Then Trunk or Treat is the perfect thing for you. <laughs> Trunk or Treat is our outreach opportunity for our neighborhoods and community. It's a fun, safe, interactive space for families to come dress in their cute Halloween costumes and go trick or treating at every trunk. There are a couple ways that you can help make this event possible. You can join us for the day of, which is Saturday, October 29th from 12 to two as a trunk host or support staff or you can donate candy in the lobby beforehand. I think they mm. had like 400 people involved in this last year, so let's bless them with Dude, candy. Sweet. For more information and to register or to volunteer, you can go to the neighborhood page. I'd like to take a moment and say thank you for your financial giving. Uh, it's a way that we can live out the invitation that Jesus extends to us in Matthew 23. <laughs> and uh, we appreciate your act of worship. So if you feel led to give, there are multiple ways that you can do so. Uh, you can give online, on our website, through the app, or even in the boxes that are in the lobby. Again, we are so glad that you've joined us here today. Uh, would you stand up and say hi to someone around you before we begin? Hey, good morning. Glad you're here. You can actually have a seat for a minute. Before we dive into worship, I'd like you to, to introduce you to a couple of my friends. So my name is Jennifer. I'm one of the pastors here. And this is Robin and Wendy Gutierrez. And uh, Robin and Wendy, it's just a pleasure to have you with us this weekend. Uh, we've been friends since our kids were little. And uh, Robin and Wendy serve in Macas, Ecuador. And so today we want to hear a little um, from you. They're home for a few months here and heading back in January. So tell us a little bit about what you do, about your family, and where you've seen God at work. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be this morning here. Um, my name is Robin Gutierrez, and I serve um, as a school administrator at Emmanuel Christian School for the last 16 years under Global Outreach International. Good morning. I'm Wendy Gutierrez, and I serve as a wife <laughs> and a mom. You see the three uh, kids, they're 18. Joshua is now 18, Bethany is 9, and Caleb is 16. Uh, and at the school, I teach English and um, help to train other ESL teachers. Emmanuel Christian School is the only Christian school in the province where we live. And uh, through um, this ministry, we um, uh, share the gospel to the kids in our community uh, through quality Christian education, English as a second language, and teaching values. This year, we are serving 410 students, 60 students more than last year. Mm -hmm. wow. And through this ministry, we have seen uh, students coming to know the Lord, their families, 
uh, marriage is being restored, our alumni um, graduating from high school, and also serving him, going to church. And I want to tell you a story about this young woman who came just suddenly to our school and gave us a huge encouragement to us. I was meeting with um, two of our staff leaders, um, just dreaming about the school. We were, at the same time, um, a little discouraged. But um, she just came and she said, I just wanted to stop by and thank the teachers for everything they taught me when I was a student here. And, um, and I, uh, I'm a Christian now, and I'm serving him in missions um, and through um, um, youth with a mission, I forgot, <laughs> youth with a mission. And um, um, the three of us were just in tears because this is what we wanted to hear. Right. God spoke to us. He told us to yeah. keep planting the seeds because he will bring growth in his timing. And I want to thank the church, the yeah. Alliance, for supporting us d during the 16 years. Uh, thank you so much for um, believing and supporting this ministry. Yeah, we really do believe in you guys. Thanks for doing it. Wendy, how can we be praying for you? Sure. Um, first of all, for our ministry, uh, the last three years, we've had a lot of changes. Uh, we went online and offline and online and offline. <laughs> And uh, we're happy to be totally at school in person right now and uh, looking for ways to continue to serve our community through education, teaching the Bible and teaching uh, parents. We wanted this year to teach uh, um, more parent workshops. Um, also for our staff, they kind of rode that roller coaster with us of online and offline. And um, if you could uh, be praying for them that they can continue to be strong in their faith and serving God in... Um, in Marcus, and then for our family as well. We um, are going through some family transitions. Uh, Joshua has gone off to college. He's uh, 18, and he's going to Liberty in Virginia. Um, Caleb will be graduating this year, and he is making decisions right now about where he's going to study after that. Um, and Bethany says, Mom, I'm going to be an only child. <laughs> so if you could pray for us too as parents as we make this transition. Yeah, that is a lot of family transition. And it's been a few years of ministry roller coaster, as you said. So church family, if you want to connect with Robin and Wendy, they'll be in the lobby between services. You could get their prayer card. They will also be at the Spotlight on Missions on October 30th, which will be at 1230 just after the final service back in the courtyard room. So if you'd like to hear more about what they're doing in Ecuador, you could join them there. Um, let's pray for them today. And if you feel comfortable, you could extend a hand towards them. We're just going to pray for Robin and Wendy. Father God, these are your dedicated servants who have been faithful to you. They've raised their family in Macus, Ecuador, and they are asking for prayer for their ministry, for the people that they love in their staff, and for the transition that their family is in. And so God, we just commit them to you and commend them to you. You alone know what they need moment by moment, day by day. Lord, we pray for peace among the relationships among the staff at the school there in Macus. We pray for vision and uh, insight and wisdom for what the ministry needs when trajectory needs to change. We just pray that you would give Robin and his leadership team amazing insight into how to lead this school, God. And for Wendy and the work that she's doing to help the teachers do well in their English and to, and to make sure that English as a second language is running well, Lord, there's so many moving pieces to this, God. And you are God of all of them. And in the midst of that, would you also hold their hearts as their family transitions to a new season? God, would you knit their family together across the miles? Would you make them stronger? Would you let their love grow? And would you give Robin and Wendy what they need as they release their boys and parent their daughter? God, just be with this family. We thank you for the kingdom work that's being done, and we, we commit it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's celebrate this, and we'll worship together. Amen. Will you guys stand as we worship? And before we sing this morning, we are going to be uh, declaring and reciting what's called the Greater Doxology. Um, this has been read and recited through churches 
since the fourth century, and we're going to continue on that tradition this morning. So I'm going to read the parts in the top, um, and where it says everyone in bold, we will all read together, okay? So glory to God who has shown us the light. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. We praise you, we bless you, we worship you. We glorify you and give thanks to you for your great glory. O oh Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O oh Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, O oh Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You who takes away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. You who sit on the right hand of God the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are holy, and you alone are Lord. You alone, O Lord Jesus Christ, are the Most High in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen, church. And as we recite that truth together, I want to give you a reminder that we exist and we gather together on a Sunday simply for this, to give glory to God. So would you bring him glory and praise? We get to do that through worship, through singing melodies and truths that bring him praise and glory and joy. So with that in your hearts, would you kind of prepare a way, prepare a way for thankfulness towards him, towards God the Father. Let's sing together. the world on oh, it could it fill me on oh, man's empty praise treasures of faith are never enough and you came along oh put me back together Sing this out, there's nothing. Well, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, no, it's true. I'm not afraid. And I'm not
for all that you're doing in our lives. God, thank you for this time we have together to just come and to worship your name, the mighty name of Jesus. All God's people said, amen. Amen, church. You guys can have a seat. Good morning again, and to those of you uh, joining us on live stream, we're glad that you're with us today. We have been, uh, just last week we started a series in Ezekiel, which is God's revelation of hope and restoration and justice. Brian launched us into this book that, that has its moments, right? So, so last week Brian talked about the glory of God and how it's so indescribable that in Ezekiel trying to describe it to us, it kind of almost reads like a sci-fi. Um, and this week we're going to turn from the glory of God is still there. We'll get back to the wheels and the eyes and the, the wings. Uh, but we're moving into the warnings and the accusations and the prophetic judgments that are coming. And it starts um, in chapter 4 with some object lessons that are a little bit bizarre. And so we're going to, I was talking with somebody before the service and he said, Jennifer, I can't wait to see what you do with these chapters. <laughs> chapters 4 through 11 here in, Eze in Ezekiel. Um, for those of you who don't have it yet or don't know that we have this, there is a study guide that was written by some folks here at Salem Alliance to go along with this sermon series about Ezekiel. And if you love diving deep into what the word is saying and the historical and the theological significance of what you're reading, you really want a copy of that. You can download it for free on our website. You can find it on Amazon or you can buy it at the Welcome Center during the weekend or even at the desk during the week. So if you love diving deep, don't miss that uh, great resource that we have. So many years ago, uh, 16 to be exact, um, our daughter Abby was born. And Abby, who many of you saw with me on Labor Day weekend, if you were here, she read a story to the kids and then was part of standing here with three generations of women with Barbara Fletcher and myself and my daughter Abby. And she's doing great. She's 16. She's on the brink of getting her driver's license. But when Abby was born, she had several birth defects that created quite a medical journey for her. Many of you were here then and you remember that journey with us. And many of you have come since then. You have no idea what I'm talking about. So I want to tell you just a piece of that. So here's a picture of Abby when she's about six months old. And this is when we began to realize that some of her medical things were a bit more sobering than we understood or than we thought. And one of those was that she had a hole in her heart. Uh, for you medical folks, it was a VSD, a ventricular septal defect. And at six months old, that hole was already almost a centimeter wide and was impacting her in a way that she was um, not thriving. She wasn't developing on pace with her peers. And so we began to see specialists and our pediatrician. They discovered the heart murmur. They did an echo. They saw that she had this hole in her heart and they came to us and they sat us down and they said, you're going to, she's going to have to have open heart surgery. That is a sobering thing to hear when you're holding a six month old, right? So we did take her in. She did have open heart surgery. This is what she looked like when she came out of surgery into recovery. She had 17 tubes, lines, and wires coming out of her body. She had a couple of days with um, on the vent tube in ICU, and then she was moved into a regular unit, and all told we were in the hospital for about a week. And as we were leaving the hospital, I said to the cardiologist, I said, so we're better than new, right? I, no, I said, we're, we're good as new, right? And he said, no, you're better than new. <laughs> See, Abby had something wrong with her heart. 
And she had to have a team of specialists and experts who knew what they were doing for a surgical procedure so that she had a chance at a thriving and fulfilling and long life so that she could develop according to her peers. See, that little hole in her heart, that little problem in her heart was already stealing so many calories that part of her heart was already enlarged and one of the valves of her heart already had some scar tissue for the way that had just been malfunctioning. See, was something wrong with her heart? She needed someone to do surgery so that she had a chance at the life that God created her to live. And that's what we find in the passage in Ezekiel this week. That there's something going on in the hearts of humanity that hardens our heart to God and that causes us to not have the life that he wants us to live. And we need God in his wisdom and what he alone can see and know to transform us and give us a heart that will allow us to live the life that he called us to live. Because God wants his people to have tender and responsive hearts. In the time of Ezekiel, he wanted his people to have hearts that were tender and responsive to him. And in our day in 2022, he wants us to have hearts that are tender and responsive to him. And yet, there are so many things that get in our way. So let's dive in here. In the first few chapters of Ezekiel 4, 5, and 6, he's... he's um, laying out this picture of these, what we call the sign acts. I call them object lessons. Things that God was act, asking Ezekiel to act out so that the nation of Israel could not just see and understand the truth that God was wanting to say, but they could feel it. These, these object lessons were meant to get beyond the mind and into the heart of, wow, we really do want to see change. So the first one was this, he asked Ezekiel to make a model of Jerusalem and then set up a siege against it. Matter of fact, when I read it the first time, I thought of my boys when they were little with their Legos and setting up all the war scenes, like setting up this model of Jerusalem and, and a siege against it, and then laying on his side and watching the siege and doing that for over a year. And, and he gave him uh, how much food to have and how much water to have and how he was to cook it while he laid there watching the siege of Jerusalem as an object lesson so people would see the weight of where they were. He had warnings. He sent his prophets to say, change your way. Don't keep doing this. Ezekiel 3.19, he told them, if you warn them and they refuse to repent and keep on sinning, they will die in their sins. So there's this mix as we read Ezekiel of, wow, God, that sounds kind of harsh. These accusations against the people, the, the prophecies of the, the punishment that's going to come. And it, it gets pretty overwhelming as you read through it. And yet, if we pause... We realize that God is relentless in pursuit of his people by any means necessary. And in this particular passage, we see his creative communication as he gives these object lessons. He tells Ezekiel to cut his hair and then let a third of it blow away and a third of it get burned and a third of it get scattered. And this is the prophecy of what's going to happen to the people of Israel. We can see this as harsh or we can read this as God wanting his people to stop, to see how important it is, and to turn. Even his accusations, they're specific, but they also give people a way out. Stop worshiping idols. It gives us a way out. God wants us to see and understand, to feel and embrace, and to turn and repent because he wants us to know this truth. John 8.32 says this, And you will know the truth... And the truth will set you free. So why is God so persistent in his pursuit of us to show us and teach us and let us hear and see his truth? Because he wants us to be free. And he wanted the nation of Israel to be free. And he wants his children in Salem, Oregon in 2022 to be free. Because he created us to be free, not a slave to sin or a slave to any earthly master. So... What keeps us from knowing this truth and being set free? What kept the Israelites from staying true to the covenant that they had with God? See, there was a covenant God had made with his people, and it was an if-then covenant. He said, if you obey and follow my ways, then I will bless you, and I will protect you, and I will give you a land, and I will give you a future. But if you disobey and you don't follow my ways and you follow the ways of the nations around you, then I will withdraw my presence and you will face the natural consequences for what is happening and I will stir up your enemies against you in order to draw you back to myself. 
So basically, if you obey, these great things will happen. And if you disobey, these terrible things will happen. And Israel had broken their covenant. Why would a nation that has known God and walked with God, been rescued from Egypt and seen the Jordan River split as they took the promised land and the walls of Jericho fall, they had these stories, generation after generation after generation of God's faithfulness. Why would they harden their hearts against this God and worship anything other than him? And I think the answer to this is something that you and I need to explore today because we do the same things, often motivated by the same reasons. See, idol worship begins and ends with a stony, stubborn heart. See, we seek something other than God to fulfill our needs when our hearts have been hardened by something in our life. When we get to Ezekiel chapter 8, This is where the wheels and the eyes and the wings come back in. Ezekiel has a vision of the glory of God and it lifts him up and it moves him to where he is seeing a vision in Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, what Ezekiel sees is an idol placed near the altar in the very temple of the living God. Some would say that perhaps this is the idol of Asherah that was set up by the evil king Manasseh. He also sees the leaders of Israel burning incense to idols and to false gods. In another part of Jerusalem, God shows him women weeping for a false god, for the failure of their false security. And in the temple again, men bowing down and worshiping the sun from the temple of the living God, the temple where God's glory rested. Brian talked last week about when we miss the glory, when it becomes commonplace, when we take it for granted, we don't see the glory of God. And here in this place of God's glory, they were worshiping other gods. How had they come to this place where they broke their covenant with the living God and they were worshiping idols in the place that was built to honor and glorify God? The definition of idol worship that I found is the worship of something or someone other than God as though it were God. And I would add, when we trust something other than God as though it were God, when we look for safety or security or healing or wholeness from someone or something other than God as though it were God, It's not as if we just wake up one day and say, okay, I'm going to worship this other thing. No, it happens a little more subtly than that, a little more gradually than that. Here's what I see with the Israelites. They missed the glory of God, and when we're not connected to the God who made us, that's when we're tempted to try to find a connection to something else to fill the emptiness inside. For most of you, this is not a new thought, but we have a hole in our heart with a desire for something outside of ourselves because that is how God created us. And if we don't stay connected to the glory and the power and the grace of God, then we're tempted to fill that hole with something other than God, but we will never be satisfied. We will never be content. We will never be fully healed or fully whole because the hole is a God-shaped hole and he is the only one who can fill it. So when we have hardened hearts, maybe there was a disappointment or there was a broken relationship or there's a physical illness or there's, there's something that you hoped for that didn't come to be a bitterness, a root of bitterness that has grown up in your heart. Maybe you've decided that, that you just have to defend yourself. Friends, the wall of self-defense that comes up to keep us safe in the world around us, that's also a wall that hardens our heart and keeps out God. Maybe it's that we struggle with the part of God that we don't understand. Maybe it's that we want something that we can control and wrap our brains around. And that's what we will worship and that's what we will trust because we can understand it. Because how can we trust something that we don't understand? And yet God is not understandable because he is God. The very reason that he can fill the hole in our heart is the very reason that sometimes it's hard to believe that he could fill the hole in our heart. Because we can't quite wrap our uh, brains around it. And so we struggle with the part of God that we don't understand. And we seek for a small g God that we can understand, that we can control because somehow we believe that that's going to be the thing that can help us with the thing that we need help with. And we make our God too small and we are idol worshipers. When I was um, spending some time with this passage and there was a point in time when I I had read it and reread it and prayed about it and had preaching team meeting and I was still just like, God, how do I take these passages and make them make sense (laughs) and and have a cohesive message? And and God brought me to a place in his word that, that reminded me that before I can share a message with someone else, I have to receive the message for myself. 
And so I read back through these chapters again, saying, God, what do you have to say to me? And here's what he showed me in this part about idol worship, as I was asking the question, what, what drives us to worship something else? What would motivate me to turn from God, even in a subtle subconscious way? And for me, it's something I've confessed from this platform before. It's that perfectionism, right? I'm a recovering perfectionist. I know that it is my default to see the world through a lens that says, if I do the right things, if I know the right things, and if I behave in the right way, then God will be pleased with me, I will be happier, and the people around me will do better. Like, I've got this God complex that I'm responsible for all these people, and God just lovingly and gently said, Jennifer, that perfectionism is your idol. You are trusting in your own behavior to make you whole rather than trusting in my grace to make you whole. Now, does God ask us to be obedient and righteous and to seek to follow him? Absolutely. But is that my salvation? Absolutely not. So this idol worship is when we take something and put it in the place of God and it can happen so seamlessly, friends. It can be so subtle. But are there ways that we have sought to worship something safe within our control and so turn to something other than God? Here's an if-then test that Kari Menarchek uh, shared with me at preaching team this last week. If you take this if fill in the blank, then fill in the blank. If this happens, if I get financial security, if this person enters into a relationship with me, if my prodigal child comes back, if I'm healed of this physical illness, if this person apologizes to me, if this happens, then I will be satisfied. I will be whole. I will be happy. I will be content. Friends, anything that fills in that first blank that isn't God is where we have a temptation towards an idol. And when God brings that to mind, if you can think of something that you've been waiting for or hoping for or banking on, or you've got a sense of entitlement or expectation that God, this has to happen so that my life will be what you want my life to be, that could be the gentle, loving voice of the Holy Spirit of the living God giving you a warning, much like he was warning the nation of Israel to say, that is not going to fulfill your heart. That is not going to answer the deep and true needs of your heart because God wants his people to have hearts that are tender and responsive to him. And if we want to have that tender, responsive heart, then we need to be people with humility who will pay attention to the loving promptings of the spirit of the living God and with humility confess where we have put something ahead, a desire or a demand ahead of God in our own lives and surrender that idol to him. Surrender that way of coping to him. Surrender that addiction to him so that he can truly fill us. Because what we find as we come to the end of our passage is that God alone can change our hearts and give us life. We can spin our wheels as long as we want, but until we surrender to God, our heart remains stony and stubborn and hardened to him, and he wants his people to have tender and responsive hearts. We come to Ezekiel chapter 11, and here's what's happening in the story. So Ezekiel has been preaching these warnings and these object lessons and these punishments, and it's been ramping up. And if you really read word for word, it really ramps up, folks. (laughs) It gets pretty crazy in there. And as it comes to this height, it says, while I was still prophesying, Pelatiah, son of Benaiah, suddenly died. Okay, picture this. Ezekiel's preaching, 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 warning, warning, accusing, talking about the punishments that are to come, and a guy just drops dead. And Ezekiel, these are my words, freaks out, okay? In Ezekiel 11, chapter, uh, verse 13, he says, I fell face down on the ground and cried out, Oh, sovereign Lord, are you going to kill everyone in Israel? <laughs> and God, in his loving mercy, realized that his prophet needed a breath of fresh air. <laughs> He needed a view of the future. He needed a foreshadowing of what was to come, that it wasn't always going to be punishment and exile. And so he says in Ezekiel chapter 11, starting in verse 16, I will be a sanctuary to you during your time in exile. I, the sovereign Lord, will gather you back from the nations where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel once again. When the people return to their homeland, they will remove every trace of their vile images and detestable idols. And I will give them singleness of heart and put a new spirit within them. 
Look at this with me again. It's God who's going to put a new spirit within us. I will take away their stony, stubborn heart. God's the one who takes away our hard heart. And I will give them a tender and responsive heart. The heart that God wants us to reflect to him, the heart he wants us to live with, it's a heart that's a gift of his grace and mercy to us. So they will obey my decrees and regulations and then they will truly be my people and I will be their God. Friends, This is the foreshadowing of Jesus. This is the gospel of Christ, that we who are dead in our sins, whose hearts are dead within our body, whose spirit is dead within our body, when we recognize that Jesus came and sacrificially died and rose again for us, that he is the son of God who forgives our sins and we surrender to him, he says that he gives us his Holy Spirit to breathe life into us. The New Testament authors called it being born again. This is the transition from a stony, stubborn heart heart to a tender, responsive heart. How? Because we tried hard enough? No, because of the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. This is the good news of Jesus, and it's being foreshadowed in this book of judgment and warnings and accusations, but it's also hope and restoration and justice. This book that weaves with the hard things to hear, the hard things to understand, and yet this glimpse of the mercy and the glory of God on display through his loving kindness towards us. God breathes new life into a soul and he gives the living spirit a place to reside inside of us. We become the temple of the living God. And rather than needing to worship or trust or look to something else to save us, God gives us a heart that recognizes his voice, that sees him on the move in our world and that trusts him with the needs in our life. Sometime when we're reading the Old Testament, especially in a book like Ezekiel, There can be moments that I read this, and I'm assuming some of you do, that we kind of get this disconnect between the violence and the harshness and the accusation and the tone of the prophets, and it's hard to reconcile that with the tone of a loving God. We can kind of get to this place where we go, there's there's this disconnect, and God, I don't understand, and I don't know how it can seem so harsh in the Old Testament, yet so full of grace and mercy in the New Testament. And I want us, as we consider this, and consider a perspective that we might look through the rest of this book of Ezekiel with, this, this, this change of our focus and a filter in which to read the Bible, I want to go back to the story of my daughter, Abigail. Because, see, when there was an expert who told us that there was something wrong with her heart that was going to cause her to not be able to grow, not be able to thrive, and shorten her life, we had to make a choice to hand our baby girl off to strangers who were going to do something horrible to her. Horrible. And, and forgive if this is a little too graphic, but I really want this point to come home right now. We handed our daughter to strangers who were going to cut open her chest, spread her ribs, stop her heart, fix a birth defect, close up the chest with metal sutures through her sternum, stitch up the muscles and the skin and give her back to us looking like this. It was traumatic. It was bruising. It was scarring. And if you didn't know the reason why, if you didn't know that the outcome was to actually give her life and the chance at a quality life, you would look at the situation and you would cry abuse, neglect. How could you? That's horrible. And yet, when we know the outcome, We can grieve at a picture like this, but we are so rejoicing because it was so worth it, friends. Within a week, Abigail was home, rolling over, smiling, growing, developing. And if we lose sight of the fact that everything we read from Genesis to Revelation is born out of God's desire for his children to have tender and responsive hearts to him so that they can be free by knowing his truth and live not in slavery to sin, but under the glory and the grace of God, then we lose sight of the fact that sometimes it takes a surgeon, a hard path, in order to let us be reborn with a soft and tender heart to him.
Perhaps that is a different filter and perspective for the way we can look at the things that we scratch our heads about in the Old Testament as we recognize that the outcome is well worth it because God has always been pursuing us. He has always sent us his spirit to convict us of our sin and he will always offer us new life in Christ for those who choose and want to follow him. This is the good news of Jesus, that our suffering is not in vain, That his punishment is not out of a punitive heart, but always out of wanting to draw his people back to himself. So, what is our response to this? What is our response to this message of a God who pursues us? Of idols that will seek to pull our attention away from him? And of the gift of grace in Christ as he gives us soft hearts? One is expectancy. If we believe that God is pursuing us, then we believe that there are things in our life each day that will be a reflection of him. So we ask the question, is this you, God? Are you in this somewhere? What are you telling me through this person or this circumstance or this situation? We live with expectancy that God is pursuing us and that we can see him at work around us. The second one is examine. I didn't spell this wrong on purpose or on accident. This is a a practice of examining our lives at the end of each day and giving God an opportunity to speak with us. So we quiet our heart and we give a little space and we examine God, what were you pleased with today? What grieved your heart today? Where were you at work today? Where did I not see you today? We notice the the areas in our life that, that bring consolation. And we notice the areas in our life that bring desolation. And we, and we line ourselves with the consolation and, and it's an opportunity for confession, for repentance and for turning. And the third one is this, to embrace. To embrace the gift of God that he has given us. He calls us to a holy standard and yet he knows that we can't meet that standard and so he fills the gap and he is the one who will turn our hearts towards him and will give us a soft and a tender heart. He is the one who will bring new life into us and so we embrace that gift as a gift, recognizing that we can never earn it. That's not what this is about. It's not what Ezekiel about. It's not about earning God's favor. It's about embracing God's gift and his grace. And this embracing is what we celebrate when we come to the communion table together. Last week, Brian said that the glory of God was all of God on display for us to see. Then communion is the glory of God on display through his loving sacrifice and his resurrection and the gift of grace and forgiveness that he gives us and the new life that he gives. That's what we celebrate together today. At Salem Alliance, we practice open communion. That means you don't have to be a member or a partner here to take communion with us. But if you are a Christ follower who has expressed faith and belief in Jesus, you are welcome at the table. How we do this here is that you will come forward in your own time. Friends, there's plenty of time. There doesn't need to be a rush. If you're coming up this center aisle, can I just say you can just go either way? (laughs) It's fine here. Everybody knows how to merge. We'll be good. You can either take the bread and dip it in the cup or we have the self-serve cups with the bread in them. Just come up and you're welcome to the table. I would invite you to do this reflectively, not flippantly. To take some time to consider your heart before you come. But when you come... Come in celebration of the gift that he gives. Let's pray. Father God, as we sit before you now and we come before the communion table, I invite you, Holy Spirit, to examine our hearts, to open our eyes and our hearts and our minds. God, everywhere over this room, you are speaking through this message, through the worship, through through their own thoughts. You are speaking to people. Lord, I pray that you would bring to mind those things that perhaps we've trusted other than you. And would you give courage to surrender those things? And as we come to the table, to come knowing that you alone can fill our hearts and can give us new life. And we celebrate that and remember that today, God. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for this reminder of your gift of grace as we come and take the bread that represents your body broken for us and the juice that represents your blood shed for us God we come with gratitude and humility our hearts are full and that's only because of you thank you Jesus we truly worship you amen
you draw me near, desperate for you. I'm desperate for you. I surrender. Seeing grace unfold, a hunger and thirst, a hunger and thirst. With arms stretched wide, I know you hear my cry. Speak to me now. Speak to me.
Father God, we do surrender all. We want to surrender all. Help us where we wrestle with surrendering all. God, as we go this week, would you continue your work and your word in our hearts and in our minds that we might continue to be moved towards a people who reflect your glory and reflect the soft heart that you desire for us. Amen. Hey, if you came today and you don't know what it is for your heart to have new life in Christ, that's a new concept for you. Following Jesus is a choice that needs to be made somewhere along the line. He doesn't, he doesn't push that on us. So if somebody dragged you to church or if you happened in today, we could, somebody would meet you at the cross, answer any questions you might have, talk with you about what it means to have new life in Christ. If you came today with another need for prayer, there'd be someone who'd meet you on the other side of the stage who would love to pray with you about the needs that you have in your life. Don't forget that you can uh, meet Robin and Wendy, Wendy in the lobby today, get a prayer card, find out a little more about what they're doing. 
Receive this as your benediction, as a blessing that we take together today. May we who have had the veil removed see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, will make us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. Friends, go in peace. being with us today. If you've missed a previous service and want to get caught up, feel free to access all our weekend services at livestream.com slash Salem Alliance. One more thing, we would like to pray for you. We believe that God hears us and cares about our needs. You can begin that process by going to salemalliance.org and clicking prayer support. Have a great week.